All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Nicolina Astorina, and I am the Director of Alumni Relations. I'm here tonight with my colleague, Rose Elsadani, Class of 2016, Alumni Coordinator. Tonight is our second installment of the Alumni Speaker Series. This series is brought to you by the Alumni Association Board of Directors, Alumni Engagement Committee, and this is your chance to learn and hear from fellow alumni, learn about their journeys, and make new connections. Topics are going to range, and we're really excited about tonight's live discussion with Kate Grace Smith, class of 2008, and owner of Grace Space Gnosis for you this evening. We want to thank all those who are attending live right now. We have a great crowd with us this evening, a mix of alumni, faculty, and staff, and friends. We're really excited to have you here. Special thanks to our alumni board members and any board of trustees who are joining us as well. Just a few friendly video reminders. You will be able to use the Q&A feature to pre-submit any questions for our speaker for our portion of Q&A. So throughout the session, please feel free to add any questions. Our chat will be disabled for the evening. Uh, we will also be asked to respond to a poll. So get ready for that sometime throughout our portion of the discussion and know that everyone is off camera and muted. So unfortunately our panelists cannot see you all, but hopefully it will come to a time where we all could all meet in person and do this together. Uh, so thank you all for joining. What I'd like to do now is introduce you to our moderator for the evening, Kaylin Kelly, class of 2008. She's a member of our Alumni Association Board of Directors and serves on the Alumni Engagement Committee as co-chair. And she was classmates with Grace during her time at Wagner. So I'm going to kick it off to you, Kaylin. Great. Thank you, Nicolina. And thank you, everyone, for joining today. It is my honor and privilege to introduce Kate Grace Smith. Uh, Grace, as she goes by now, is a Wall Street Journal bestselling author and the founder and owner of Grace Space Hypnosis, the world's number one provider of hypnotherapy education, products, and services, including Grace Space Hypnosis app, which, by the way, I love. Grace is also the founder and lead instructor of the Grace Method Hypnotherapy Certification School, which trains the next generation of world-class hypnotherapists. Her company is, is officially the 46th fastest growing company in Florida out of the Inc. 5000 in 2020, which is extremely impressive. Grace's work has been featured all over the place, from BBC News, The Atlantic, US News World Report, Entrepreneur, InStyle, Glamour, BuzzFeed, Bustle, Mind, Body, Dream, Pop, Sugar, Forbes, and I could go on and on. She's really she's been a regular on a number of television shows, including Dr. Oz, the CBS hit show The Doctors, and including men, mental health educator Med Circle. She's also the author of three books, and, and another on the way. First is Close Your Eyes, Get Free. Uh, that's an Amazon bestseller and one that I'm currently reading. Close Your Eyes and Use Wait which is a World uh, Wall Street Journal bestseller and USA Today bestseller, Close Your Eyes Sleep, which just came out this, this past December. And her upcoming book coming this fall is Close Your Eyes Relax. In 2012, Grace was a full-time corporate executive and a newly minted part-time hypnotherapist. When a client of hers broke through his stroke-induced paralysis and voluntarily moved his left arm for the first time in months during their first hypnotherapy session together, it was then that Grace dedicated her career to hashtag making hypnosis mainstream. In addition to running Grace Space Hypnosis with her husband, Bernardo, Grace works with a number of elite leaders every year, helping them break through subconscious self-sabotage so that they and their missions and their organizations can experience unprecedented growth. Grace and Bernardo live in Verona, Vero, Vero Beach, Florida with their two children, Patrick and Aurora. Now that was, Grace's professional bio, but I like to think back to our time at Wagner. We both uh, spent so much time watching her uh, establish Habitat for Humanity, hanging out on the Tau Kappa Sigma Four. You know, it's just, it was such an honor to see how the force to be reckoned with that you are at Wagner and getting to see your career evolve, you know, from afar and just keeping up with you. I'm so grateful for things like, you know, social media at this point. To see what you're putting out into the world is astonishing, but not surprising. Because the power that I saw within you at Wagner and the positive change that you're able to affect there, now you get to do on the world stage. And it's very exciting to, to say, I knew you when. <laughs> and I really hope today everyone here 
is, you know, gets to feel that power, gets to feel that passion and that love that you put out into the world and get to take a little bit of piece of you and learn a little bit from you as well. So I am excited to talk this over to you to begin this conversation and to help just educate us a little bit more on hypnotherapy and how you got here and really what is it? Yes. Well, thank you so much. That is the kindest, most loving, sweetest intro of all time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Wagner College for having me. What an honor. I love Wagner. I can't wait for us to reminisce more later on in our chat together. And also thanks TKS for making me an honorary sister. <laughs> that was a highlight of my time at Wagner for sure. So yes, hypnotherapy. I never ever in a million years while I was at Wagner would have thought that this would be my career. Interestingly enough, I ended up with an English major, a religious studies and business management double minor at Wagner. And at the time thought, what, th what am I doing? <laughs> These things have nothing to do with each other. This makes no sense, but I was just interested in these different areas. And now I use all three of, uh, you know, aspects of what I learned at Wagner every single day in my current career, which is really fascinating. And I say that because hypnotherapy is really storytelling. There is a somewhat modern figure in the history of hypnotherapy. Um, his last name is Erickson. And so Ericksonian hypnosis is very much about eliciting a feeling within someone that is greater than their present capability in the world. So it's something that's already innate within you to feel calm. It's already innate within you to feel courageous. It's already innate within you to experience the life of your dreams. And so something that I tell my clients all the time and all of our thousands and thousands of community members is your destiny isn't going to sneak up on you. Your destiny destiny won't just like come into your life by accident. You have to claim it. But if there's a desire that you have in your life, you have it for a reason. And yet there can be all of these layers of conditioning that are keeping you from getting there that result in procrastination or, you know, acting out at loved ones when it's the last thing you want to do or developing insomnia. And these are really real challenges. I don't want to give the impression at all that I'm saying it's all in your head and you can just think your way out of it. It's not that. I mean, insomnia is real. Nail biting is real. Fear of flying is real. And the potential to have the exact opposite experience so that you can move closer and forward into your destiny is also within you. So that's a really big, fancy, lofty way of saying that hypnosis is essentially meditation with a goal. And I'll just give you the quick rundown on how I got into it. And then you guys all get to experience it and we'll take it from there. And Kaylin, feel free to interrupt at any point if you feel so called. <laughs> Definitely will, not try Okay, here. great. <laughs> <laughs> so at Wagner, as Kaylin mentioned, I founded Habitat for Humanity. It was right after Katrina happened, a hurricane that was just devastating and took out most of the city of New Orleans and primarily the ninth ward. And I just felt like it was such a travesty that we couldn't do something very tangible when we were on campus. So I think I was 19 uh, at this point. I think it was early in my sophomore year. And I canvassed the campus with flyers everywhere, letting everybody know this thing was starting. I had actually already started a chapter in my high school, so I knew how to do it. And 300 people showed up to the first meeting. And almost everybody was older than me, <laughs> you know, there was juniors and seniors primarily and all of these uh, faculty members and even grad students were there and it, it was just incredible. So we can talk about more of that later if you'd like. But what came from that is a lot of fundraising experience. So we weren't able to build all of the time with Habitat. There's limited housing opportunities being built in the tri-state area. So there was a lot of section eight housing that we could upgrade, but we couldn't do a lot of building in New York. We weren't allowed to go to New Orleans for the first year after Katrina happened. So we were finding ways to make an impact. And one of the ways is to raise a lot of money so that when the time came and we could go do these trips that we could bring as many of our members as possible. So we started doing these black tie gala fundraisers and I just, they were really fun. And we, you know, we would raise, yeah. They were taking over. 
<laughs> they were amazing. We raised yeah. a lot of money and our executive board was incredible. The executive board was all students, but I kind of was a tyrant. I mean, let's be real. I mean, the way that I ran it, I cared so much and I had zero managerial experience <laughs> or ability to <laughs> inspire and still, you know, not kind of be a tyrant. So it was very successful. And Dr. Garasi, who was the president at the time, really took note. And he was kind enough to let somebody know who was running their capital campaign at Wagner at the time, hey, this girl's really good at fundraising. And so I had a job right out the gate from Wagner at the world's number one fundraising firm, CCS. And I thought I was going to be raising hundreds of millions of dollars for Habitat for Humanity and United Way and Amnesty International. And interestingly enough, uh, with my comparative religion background, I was put at the Archdiocese in Philadelphia. And it was a very stressful time. Um, President Barack Obama was running for office. Philly has, I mean, all cities, but Philly in particular, there was a lot of unrest at the time. I had huge quotas to meet. I think the campaign was 320 million that I was on and it was 2008. So, you know, actually it was 2009 now. So peak of the recession and essentially a lot of fundraising as much as I love it. And, and so I'm devoted to um, development efforts which I was then able to do at Wagner after this, a little foreshadowing it's kind of glorified, like asking people for money, right? So yeah. in the peak of the recession, having your hand out is very, very stressful. So all of this arc of this story was to say that I was incredibly stressed out and I had zero healthy coping mechanisms. I didn't know anything about meditation outside of like a little bit of intellectual knowledge from different religions I'd studied. I hadn't, I didn't exercise. I had absolutely no way to cope with this crushing stress and anxiety. And to be perfectly honest, for me, it was also an identity crisis because I thought I was going to be changing the world. And here I was kind of putting my hand out in an ecosystem that was so foreign to me. So fast forward a little bit, I then got to work at development, um, development at Wagner. And then I worked for a company, a Silicon Valley startup, also doing sales and fundraising there. And I just got to the point really young, really early on, which was so great that my partying was just out of control. And I'm so grateful for that. And at 24, I think most people wouldn't necessarily say like, oh, this is a problem. They would just say you work hard and you party hard, but I knew it was a problem. I really, really knew. And so I was super lucky at 24 years old to get sober. Now, partying had been a huge part of my identity. I lived in the Lower East Side of New York City and I was able to give that up. But six months into my sobriety, I was still chain smoking cigarettes, which really surprised me because I really wanted to stop. I didn't really want to stop partying. I just knew I needed to. <laughs> I really wanted to stop smoking and I couldn't. And I tried everything, patches, gum, cold turkey, and nothing was working. Finally, someone suggested hypnosis. I went in with my arms crossed over my chest, totally not expecting it to work. But at this point, what did I have to lose? Plus getting sober is a very humbling experience. So I was on a humble kick. <laughs> and I went in, had one session and never smoked again. It was the most fascinating, relaxing experience I'd ever had. Mm. And immediately my like injustice our alarms start blaring. And I'm like, why does anybody have emphysema? Why does anybody have lung cancer? Why is there anybody in the world who's smoking who doesn't want to smoke? Why did I think this thing wouldn't work when it's the only thing that did? Why did I think this would be creepy with swinging watches? when it was not at all creepy. It was one of the most relaxing, fascinating things I've ever experienced. So as Kaylin knows, and as you might be putting together, if you don't already know me, when I get up on my high horse, you like can't drag me off of it. So I had to make sure that this thing wasn't just a fluke before I really got into it. So I tested out, I had a debilitating fear of public speaking, which might surprise you, but I really, really did. It almost killed me to talk at those uh, black tie gala events. I worked so hard to opt out of public speaking at Wagner at then it was a requirement. I don't know if it still is. I, I remember. <laughs> yes. I went through all these hoops because I was like, if I have to sit in a class and wait for my turn to give a fake toast, I'll actually have a panic attack in class. I can't do it. Even though I was a, 
a fairly decent public speaker when I was absolutely forced to. So anyway, that, that goes to show you how much I didn't want to do it. After 10 sessions of hypnosis, I was the lead singer in an all girl rock band <laughs> touring around the Lower East Side just for fun. And now, you know, I'm paid money to speak. So that goes to show you the difference between one session for quitting smoking and 10 for overcoming fear of public speaking. With smoking, I didn't want to smoke at all. I hated the smell. I hated the cost. I hated what it was doing to me. I hated how it looked. I hated everything. I quit in one session. Overcoming public speaking, that fear requires you to speak in public, which I didn't want to do. I wanted to overcome the fear, but I didn't actually want to do the thing. So that took a whole whopping 10 sessions, like nothing for me to completely change my life. So it was at that point that I said, all right, I got to get certified in this thing. I started helping people on the side. Everyone I helped, no matter what we were working on, their lives dramatically changed. And then Kaylin, as you mentioned in the intro, I helped a man break through his paralysis. He had a stroke in Syria. He was a United Nations peacekeeping officer there. His United Nations convoy was bombed. He had a stress-induced stroke, was paralyzed on the left-hand side of his body. He was flown to New York City, uh, hadn't moved in nearly four months at all, not a muscle on the entire left-hand side of his body. And so he was very depressed. He was suicidal. And I was asked if I could help him with his depression. And the honest truth was I had no idea if I could. Because the fact is depression, as many of you may know, as I know personally from having experienced postpartum depression quite severely twice now, it robs you of your energy. And it also can rob you of your sense of worthiness to actually get better because there's a lot of shame that comes with it. So there aren't a lot of people with chronic depression who seek out hypnotherapy for that reason. There obviously are exceptions, but I think the only reason why I had this session with Alex was because his family asked me to and his doctors gave the okay. So when I walked into the room, there was this broken man. He could barely look me in the eyes, obviously very skeptical. He closed his eyes. We began the session. And halfway through the session, I got this thought in my head that said at the time, I still wasn't Grace yet, my middle name, Kate, <laughs> he's military, be militant. So I got a little bit more amplified with my tonality. And I said, Alex, imagine you're in a helicopter flying over a city at night and it's a topographical map of your brain. You can see where the lights are working. You can see where the electricity is on and you can see where there's a blackout where the electricity has stopped working. Fly to the blackout and let me know when you're there. And he did and he gave me a thumbs up. And I said, okay, when I count down from three to one and snap my fingers, an explosion will take place where that blackout once was. Three, two, one. And when I snapped my fingers, he flinched. And I said, now the electricity from that explosion travels down the left-hand side of your face, travels down through your left arm, travels through your left hand, travels out your left finger. And I hadn't even finished the word and he was moving his left finger. So his That's, eyes, go ahead. How powerful was that for you in that moment? Like, what did I that- I started crying hysterically. That's what I did. <laughs> I just burst into hysterical tears. And so I'm already crying. He's opening his eyes and he said, what do I do now? And I'm just sobbing. And I said, just keep moving your finger. <laughs> <laughs> I had no professional acumen. I'd only been doing this three months, part-time. I was sobbing my eyes out. So he starts sobbing his eyes out. Then the nurses run in, they start crying. The doctors come in and they're like, what's happening here? And the very best part of that story, this man, Alex, now walks without a cane. He's in charge of nuclear security in Brazil. And I ended up marrying his son. So that is how yeah. <laughs> I met the man who would become my future father-in-law. That's how I met him. So Bernardo and I had been dating for one month when his dad was flown to New York and he said, do you think you can help my dad? And I said, I have absolutely no idea, but let's see. So obviously I was a shoe into the family after that. So that day I watched a man break through his paralysis and I said, people are suffering needlessly because they think this thing is either mind control, which it isn't. I'll debunk that for you in a second. Or they think it's clucking chickens in a ridiculous stage show, which it's not. Or they think it's swinging watches. So people are biting their nails when they don't want to, to being afraid of flying when they don't have to, to being paralyzed when they don't have to. 
So that day I put in my two weeks notice walking down Fifth Avenue back to my house on the Lower East Side. I literally called my boss and I was like, I love you. I love this job. I have to go do this thing. I'm putting in my notice. And she was so upset. And she thought I was losing it as did everybody else I knew for a good long while <laughs> uh, to go become a hypnotist. A hypnotist. I mean, they everybody really thought I was uh, but the next week I launched my business with a living social. So like a group on, and I sold 954 sessions in 24 hours. I couldn't have them turn it off fast enough. My account executive was in LA. I was in New York. I was like, turn this off. It's only me. She thought we were going to sell like 70. And I had to do a thousand sessions my first year as a full-time hypnotherapist. So I basically got a PhD and my husband, the son of Alex, and I have been on a mission to make hypnosis mainstream ever since. And as Kaylin mentioned, we're now the number one company in the space. So it's been a wild ride, a very interesting journey to go from a job, you know, the Silicon Valley startup that looked very prestigious and sounded very fancy and had a lot of fun perks to being a hypnotist that no one understood. People just freely make fun of but in the former job, I was making zero difference in the world. I mean, zero. And in the, you know, my current role in the world, every single day, every single session, people's lives are changing to degrees. I mean, I just told you the story, right? I mean, to that degree. So it's been interesting. It's been interesting to adapt to the change in perception. And now it's been long enough that I'm used to it, but the first few years were pretty rough. So I'll pause there because I've been talking nonstop for a while and then I'd love to debunk two myths and then we can have an experience. <laughs> oh, I was all in. I wanted to really push you on that. As, as something that's still up and coming, I mean, you are really creating this space of hypnotherapy. You are one of the voices that are, are shaping this for years to come and pioneering this space out that like how, what do you do every day when you encounter somebody that's like whoa like what a, like you know what like you said or watch or I saw this guy on a cruise ship make somebody do something silly when he snapped his fingers like how do you approach those myths or how do you tackle that what are the like what how do you bring that or what, what do you wish that we knew about yeah. hypnotherapy absolutely so my range of tackling it has ebbed and flowed over the years. <laughs> there were times where I was very gracious and like, oh, I went in skeptical. And then there were times where, I mean, oh, this poor woman, I was having a bad day. And it had just been a lot of years of kind of pushback and whatever. And I, you know, I'm telling her about what I do and she goes, oh, did that work? And I just went, no, no, all day long. I just, do something that has zero efficacy. <laughs> like, um, I was so snarky before the guy to call her and apologize after. But so I've had a range. I don't want to make it sound like I've always just been understanding that that there is a misconception, even though my role in the world very much has been re-educating people. It does get old. It does get old to go to a party and someone meets you and you say, oh, I'm a hypnotherapist. And they go, are you doing it now? And or they go, you know, oh, that's against my my faith. And the subtext of that is you're doing the work of the devil, right? And so it does, it does get old. But ultimately, what I come back to, what I tell my students, my my hypnotherapy certification students, is it's not our job to evangelize. That's not our job. As much as I would love that everyone in the whole wide world do hypnotherapy because I know they'd feel better afterwards, hypnotherapy only works when you want it to work. It's not mind control. And are attempting or pushing or trying to convince people to change their mind about something they might not care about at all does nothing <laughs> it won't make them experience it and it won't make them get more out of it and so what we need to do is just honestly and openly present the truth and scientific evidence to back it up so that when and if somebody down the road goes through something and they realize you know i think this is in my subconscious and i have no idea how to access my subconscious and somewhere along the way, I met a nice non-snarky hypnotherapist. <laughs> so maybe I should give her a ring. You know, that's the only way to do it. And um, so that's what we're really committed to. So 
how I know hypnosis is not mind control. The little joke I always tell in the beginning of my speeches is if it were, everyone would just bring me their significant other and a checklist and I'd already be a billionaire. So <laughs> that is to say, I can't even make someone pick up their socks off the floor if they don't want to, right? And genuinely, if someone could just control your mind, there would be this like zombie apocalyptic scene every time a hypnotist left their house. People would be covering their ears and covering their eyes and running down the street. <laughs> and finally, you know, anybody who like, if, if hypnosis were that easy, every major conglomerate would just hire a hypnotist to be in their commercials. And instead of watching television and scrolling through and yeah, maybe getting some subliminal messaging that builds up over time, but people think hypnosis is like this immediate mind control thing. You wouldn't be able to watch a show. You'd have to get up every 30 seconds and get into your car and drive to the nearest store to like go get downy paper towels against your will because they're telling you to. So no one can make you do anything you don't wanna do. And as illustrated by my examples of one session for quitting smoking and 10 for overcoming fear of public speaking, the degree to which you want the result indicates how quickly you'll get the result, right? So if, if you drag your father to hypnosis because you so desperately want this man you love to stop smoking and he has zero desire to stop, you're just gonna waste your money and the hypnotherapist's time. So there's that. And then real quick, I'll go over the, the stage hypnosis stuff. <laughs> so, because everybody's like, yeah, but I've seen this. So what's happening there? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> so at a stage hypnosis show, the hypnotherapist, well, they're not usually hypnotherapists, the hypnotist is watching the audience and they do a couple of suggestibility tests. So they'll say something like, imagine you're holding a lemon, make it really, really real. And half the people in the audience will be like this. And some of them will be like this. And some of them will be like this. And then they'll say, okay, now roll the lemon around. And some of them will go like this. And then they'll say, now bite into the lemon. And the people who bite in and go, like they're tasting the bitterness of the lemon, the hypnotist and their assistant have, they know who they all are now. So then when they ask for volunteers and they always ask for volunteers, they don't drag anybody up against their will. So people are voluntarily opting in to go make a fool of themselves publicly. <laughs> they choose the people who bit into the lemon to go up. And it's not always the lemon thing. So if you're at a show and you're like, they didn't do a lemon thing, there's other suggestibility tests, basically to see how much you're buying in. Then once you're on the stage, they're going to give suggestions. They're going to help you relax. And when you're in the theta brainwave state, which is where hypnosis and deep meditation take place, you are more creative and you are less inhibited. You're basically like a seven-year-old kid. So anybody who is around kids knows when their favorite song comes on, wherever they are in the world, they're gonna boogie down, right? It could be in the middle of the grocery store. It could be in the middle of the movie theater. It could be anywhere wearing anything. And a 12 year old wouldn't be caught dead doing that <laughs> at all, right? So yes, when you go into a state of hypnotherapy, state of hypnosis, you go into the state of brainwave state. So your inhibitions are lowered, but you're not out of control. So they'll start by giving benign suggestions like pretend you're in a band. And 90% or 95% will pick an instrument and play it out. By the time they get to the last suggestion, which might be shake your booty or whatever, you know, it's like they get more and more <laughs> suggestive and risque as time goes on. Not only are 90% not participating, they've been removed. When people stop participating, they take them off the stage. So by the end of the show, you're only watching the one or two people who said yes to every single suggestion because they wanted to. So if it were mind control, the same people who pretended to play the trumpet would have to do whatever the most ridiculous suggestion is at the end, but they don't. And then finally, sometimes there's a suggestion which says, um, you can forget to remember or remember to forget everything that happened up there. So then if you poll 50% of the participants, 50% likely will say, yeah, I remember everything I was doing. I felt a little bit relaxed, but I knew what I was doing. I knew what I was saying. Yeah. And 50% will go, I have no idea what I did. I don't remember anything. It's like a black wall. And those people absorb the suggestion because a part of them wanted to forget it because they were just acting quite ridiculous. So it's still all a matter of free will and choice. So that having been said, who wants to be hypnotized? <laughs> Oh, I, I hope everybody here. <laughs> I'm all in. 
Awesome. Okay. So this group experience we're going to do is for decreasing stress. It's actually self-hypnosis. So it's something that you can learn to do on your own, anytime, any place to regulate uh, your state. So if you find yourself peaking into high stress and high anxiety, you're not thinking clearly, your creativity has been diminished. It might be so chronic that your digestion is being impacted. We all know there's lots of debilitating effects of ongoing chronic stress and anxiety. So this helps you get out of that. So it, you could call that prescriptive, right? You've got a problem, here's the prescription to get out of it. But the very cool thing about self-hypnosis is with enough practice, it becomes preventative so that you stop spiking up into those levels in the first place. Barring a huge life change, catastrophe, trauma, or hormonal thing that's whacking you out, it will prevent those spikes from happening. So what I'd love for everyone to do, I'm gonna open up the poll and you're going to vote on your current stress level. So we can't see who's choosing what, but zero is zero stress, the most relaxed you can possibly be. And nine would be a full blown panic attack. So let's just give a few moments for everybody to vote on their starting level. Well, I'm gonna be very public. I cannot vote, but I'll say I'm about a six. I'll give her, I'll be, you know, I'll be public with mine. It wouldn't let me click a button, so. Good. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I, I right now, I mean, I'm a little hyper given the situation, but I'm, I'm probably about a four, four and a half to start. Okay, so we've got a seven, a few fives, a few fours, a few threes. Okay, a fairly relaxed group, I must say. Oftentimes, the average is more that I see, especially when I go do work with corporate offices, it's more like an eight people living in the state of an eight day in and day out. Okay, well, thank you very much for participating in the first poll. So let's go ahead and have you close your eyes. Take another nice deep letting go breath. Already beginning to relax both mind and body. Relax all of the muscles in your face. Relax all of the muscles in your body. And begin to imagine the color blue forming at the top of your head. Whether you think it or feel it or know it or sense it or see it, however you experience that blue is perfect and correct. Now imagine that blue flowing in through the top of your head, all the way through your body, out the bottoms of your feet, down into the center of the earth. Blue relaxing you, blue releasing you. Blue taking you all the way down. You realize now your eyelids are wonderfully deeply relaxed. Your eyelids are so wonderfully deeply relaxed, they just want to stay closed. No matter how hard you try to open them, they just want to stay closed. So stop trying and relax now. As you imagine blue, flowing in through the top of your head, all the way through your body, out the bottoms of your feet, down into the center of the earth, blue relaxing you, blue releasing you, blue taking you all the way down, repeating in your mind after me, five, I'm relaxing more and more. Four. I'm relaxing more and more. Three. I'm going deeper and deeper. Two. 
and I'm relaxing more and more. One, I'm relaxing more and more. Now repeating three times after me, I am safe. I am calm. I choose to be here. Take a nice deep letting go breath. Twice more, I am safe. I am calm. I choose to be here. Another nice deep letting go breath. I am safe. I am calm. I choose to be here. One last time, imagine blue flowing in through the top of your head, all the way through your body, out the bottoms of your feet, down into the center of the earth. Blue relaxing you, blue releasing you. Blue taking you all the way down. Now go ahead and notice your new number on the scale. Remember, zero is the most relaxed you can possibly be. Put a smile on your lips and open your eyes. Good. Yeah. Kaylin, what's your new number? If I'm at a two, that would be a lot. Yeah. Go to, I don't know how we're going to keep having this conversation. I want to go take a nap now. <laughs> no. Well, is. great job. That was just a couple minutes. You went from a six to a two. So let's have everybody vote. I mean, this is a little different. Normally I have in the chat, you write your starting number dash your final number so we can see where you started and where you ended. Uh, we know Kaylin's and mine. I mean, I go so deep so fast. I'm definitely at a zero for sure but i know someone started at a seven and now our highest number is a four and before the highest average number was a three and now we're tied at zero and one wow. so pretty powerful that's that's wonder i'm looking at my my heart rate and it was around around 90 95 and it is now 79. Yeah. Yeah. People have told me who do the heart math, they've got the connector for mind heart coherence, that they go into coherence much faster, like twice as fast with hypnosis than they even do with meditation. That's, it really is such a powerful, powerful tool that, yeah. you know, is underutilized in this world. Definitely. Yeah. Luckily, things are starting to shift and change. I mean, not too long ago, meditation was considered super weird. Acupuncture before it was considered super weird and fringe. Before that, psychotherapy was considered strange. And I know there will come a day where everybody does this all the time, simply because all it's ever had is a PR issue. It's always been this effective. It's always been this non-invasive. I mean, that was free and that was a couple of minutes. So the whole world can do this and all we have to do is overcome a couple hundred years of misunderstanding and with social media and Facebook ads, it's, it's getting easier than ever. So I maintain faith that we're getting there. That's amazing. It's, I'm trying to get back to my train of thought with this conversation because I'm like, oh, <laughs> nice comfy blanket. <laughs> I was anxious. I took a few days off from work and I made the mistake as I was signing onto my computer to look at my inbox and it was oh. like, it shocked me into anxiety, right? <laughs> what exactly what I needed before going onto the call. <laughs> so probably why I was so high, but I feel, I feel good. I feel good. great right now. Yeah. Now, I, I would love if we could pivot a little bit and start talking really as like, you know, you as a businesswoman and talking about the pathways and how you took Grace Space and you made it into this huge, successful, you know, hit of a company, you and your husband. Let's talk about that journey. Like, because it wasn't an overnight success. It was not. 
you you've come a long way and I from my understanding you you did this little startup and now this actual big company like all on your own without investors it was just you and your husband and your team and you fought through it so let's let's talk a little bit about that from that perspective definitely yeah so I'm the sole owner of the company we don't have any investors and we might take on equity partners in the future once our new app launches in a couple of weeks, which is really exciting. We, we might see where that can take us. You. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's been a journey. So for those of you who are not entrepreneurs, who are not in the business space, that's called being bootstrapped. And the benefit of being bootstrapped is you don't have anybody telling you what to do, which I love. <laughs> Uh, but also you don't necessarily get great advice or have phenomenal mentorship, especially in the beginning before you have any clout at all whatsoever. Now I have so many brilliant, amazing mentors. I can't even, I mean, I'm just so lucky, but in the very beginning when I really needed it, I didn't. And also the downside of being bootstrapped is you grow very slowly. And when you have the personality that I have, which is more faster <laughs> it's very frustrating and can be yeah it can be very painful so ever since we started we've had 70 percent growth year over year which wasn't a goal because we didn't know how to set benchmarks like that it just happened but when you start at zero 70 percent of that you know the next year it's still really low but then it starts to compound so you know fingers crossed we we maintain that if not more moving forward because i do think that we've gotten to a point where a bit of a snowball is happening but if i can think back to kind of the trajectory of how things went so i started off thinking i was just going to be a hypnotherapist with an office it didn't last long but that's what i thought it was going to be just somebody building a practice and I had those thousand sessions to do. So that first year I was exhausted. I actually lost $3 per client because I sold the sessions for $40, which is probably why we sold so many of them. Living Social took 50%. And my hourly rent, uh, because I was just renting an office hourly at like, I think a TMS place, I think that's what it's called in the city, was $23 an hour. So without you know, getting there, without, you know, so meaning no transportation costs, there's just all these other costs factored in, but just baseline, I was losing $3 per, per client for an entire year. And I didn't have any time to promote myself because I couldn't take on new people. So I didn't learn anything about business until year two, when I was already confident that I could help absolutely anybody in the world with anything without ever having met them before and without knowing what they wanna work on before they walk in the door. My level of confidence as a hypnotherapist was already so high because of that first excruciatingly painful year. So year two, I start charging real rates, which means a massive drop off, right? It means almost everybody I worked with through Living Social won't come back because hypnotherapists charge, or at least back then, it was about 150 a session in New York City and less in most other places in the country. So to go from $40 to 150, no matter how great you are, is a huge stretch for most people. And not everybody, because I've certainly gotten some great deals myself, but most, uh, more often than not, people who use flash sale sites like that are bargain hunters. So even if they have the money, they'd rather go to somebody else who's doing a sale currently than pay full price. So that was really painful because for an entire year, I had people telling me, this changed my life, this changed my life, you're so amazing, you're so amazing. And then when it came time to actually make some money, because now I'm flat broke, I'm in debt, after leaving this fancy job, nobody would pay, nobody would come back. And it hurt my feelings and I took it so personally and I had to very quickly figure out marketing. And I realized I couldn't rely on living social because I didn't want another year like that. So I think, I, at that time, I also started networking a little bit within wellness circles. And so I would gift a session to somebody who had a following, you know, people with not huge, massive followings, but maybe like 20,000 people. And so I'd gift that person a session. They'd love it. And they'd tell their social media followers. And then I would do a live group hypnosis on their, I, I don't think 
maybe live didn't exist back then. So I post something on their Facebook page. I don't know. We would get it to them somehow. <laughs> and that's how I kind of started to climb up where people were starting to know my name in New York City in the wellness community. And they'd start to invite me to things. And I started to get people paying my, my regular rate. And then I decided <laughs> the following year to double my rate. And I just figured I was that good and I was that effective and I was way better than everybody else I was meeting. <laughs> Not to be the most boastful person in the world, but I had done way more sessions than anyone. And it just comes down to practice, right? I mean, most hypnotherapists, especially before the you know advent of the internet, wouldn't do a thousand sessions in a 30 year career. People aren't exactly like breaking down the doors of hypnotists, right? Trying to get in. So I doubled my rates and exactly the same thing happened, but worse. <laughs> <laughs> I only had two clients that whole year. Oh, wow. And I can say that now because things have changed. But back then, I, again, was mortified. And once you raise your rates, if you bring them back down or I have a bunch of sales, you just keep discrediting yourself. So I had to come up with other sources of income because I still had this rent. And so I decided to train two other hypnotherapists who would charge normal rates and they would come in on the rent with me. And I taught them every day in my living room for like 12 hours a day for weeks on end. I just didn't know how to get the information across otherwise. So now I had these two people working with me at the office. I still had only two clients. <laughs> But I had faith in myself that we would get there, even though every time my, you know, credit card was overdrawn or we couldn't pay the rent and our heat got turned off in January. And now I'm kind of already known. So it's really embarrassing to be in that situation. I'm just telling all the worst stories so that everybody listening knows how hard business is, but how worth it is. <laughs> and that it hasn't been this smooth sailing thing at all. So a year in, I've gotten more PR now. I've decided to go the route of PR and really attempt to get my work into some publications. So with the same strategy of gifting sessions to journalists, I started having people write these amazing articles being like, I had three sessions with this woman. I don't bite my nails anymore. And that goes into Marie Claire. And then I, this great article with Liz Moody, who I adore, we did eight sessions. She almost gave up on me. I was like, please just keep going. And she overcame her debilitating fear of flying. And she wrote this amazing article. So now at my new rate, people are starting to come in. And now we're starting to have a little bit of extra money, just a teensy tiny bit. So we can start building online platforms. And then I'll, I'll kind of speed up through the rest. And then if there's questions on it, I can go into any little compartment. Then we launched a membership site. I saw this woman, Melanie Duncan, had a membership site and she was teaching business, like how to grow on Pinterest, which I never did. I'm still very bad at Pinterest, but she had a lot of other great courses. And I got into her membership site. She was one of the first membership sites that I've ever seen. And every month that you stayed, you got credits. And so you could unlock a new course. But if you left and wanted to come back, they'd all lock again. And I was like, Bernardo my husband. This is genius. I've watched all her stuff and I've been a member for four more months and we don't have any money and I won't quit because I don't want it to get locked because what if I need it? I don't want to have to start over again. I was like, we have to build a membership site. All of our problems will be gone. We'll finally be able to scale because here's the thing. If you're broke and you're attempting to build a business, it's nearly impossible to scale. You have to spend money on advertising. And advertising is expensive. And if you don't have an ad budget, your growth is going to be so incremental unless you get Kim Kardashian to tweet about you by some <laughs> act of God, <laughs> you need to have an ad budget. So I was like, we'll have a membership site and it will change everybody's lives and we'll have these amazing courses and then we'll finally have money to be able to scale and reach more people. So of course I wanted it to happen overnight. It took years, but we did that. And then it evolved into an app. And now we have a hypnotherapy certification school that happens all online. We also almost went bankrupt last year when COVID happened because our school was 70% of our revenue at that point. And everybody had to fly to Florida twice to study with me in person from all over the world. So we had people in China, in Turkey, in Russia who were all supposed to come last March. 
two marches ago. So we just had to shut it down. So 70% of our revenue is gone. And we didn't know if we could pivot fast enough to, to save it. And we came out stronger than ever, luckily. But there were three months while I was pregnant in a pandemic of every day being like, it's going to be over. It's going to be over. So even when you start doing great, things happen. Uh, but ultimately, now we've got this online school. We used to graduate 12 students at a time. Our last graduating class had 168. So it's so cool that we are able to do this online now without requiring people to come here. Uh, we hire our best graduates. So I believe we now have 25 people working nearly full time for us, providing hypnotherapy sessions globally via Zoom. And that's a huge team. It's the largest team that I've seen in the hypnotherapy space by a factor of at least five. And what else do we have? We've got our app, which is amazing. And the new iteration of that's coming out. And I think you know, there's thousands and thousands of people using the app. So we didn't really know where we were headed but those were the pieces and the steps that got us there. The app from a business perspective is the most interesting because wellness-based apps right now are valued at a 10X, meaning if your app does a million dollars in revenue, right? The valuation is 10 million, which means a lot more ability to scale. And even though scaling is a business term, in my mind, what that means is more people who aren't suffering needlessly. So it's been a long and winding road. That was like the overarching journey of it. But I think those were the key points of kind of how we got where we are. And it's impressive. Uh, we do have a question in the chat. I will go back to that. I know someone sent it in, but I want to just push you a little bit more on this entrepreneur. And, you know, I have a background. I've worked a lot of my career in smaller startups and coming from that realm. And, you know, it was always about raising money, scaling, building this thing that we can reach millions and millions of people. So my first question to you is you already to most in your industry probably scaled beyond their wildest dreams. Where do you see yourself going next? How do you make this bigger? What are you planning? And please, we know we don't want to divulge any, you know, secrets. Yeah. But where do you see this going next? Where's your grand vision? So it's so funny that we're finally known a little bit. And yet I still feel like we're so small. <laughs> because our mission is to make it notice it's mainstream. And you're not mainstream, even if you have a million users. There's a lot of things that we want to do, a lot of exciting things that are coming down the pike. I'm loving, so I personally now only work with about 10 to 15 VIP clients a year because our team is much more affordable, much more accessible, and can work with people all over the world at a rate that is, is accessible to many, not accessible to all. So we do have a scholarship program as well. So my VIPs are, you know, CEOs of Fortune 50 companies. And the reason why I love working with these folks is because the minute they see this change in their life, they want hypnotherapy for their entire company. So they want their 5,000 employees to have this. And we're in a position to say, great, you can. <laughs> how, how many sessions do you want? Do you want sessions for all 5,000 of your employees? Because I have hundreds and hundreds of graduates who all want to pick up the phone, change lives, hang up the phone and get paid. So we kind of have this closed ecosystem that nobody else has where we train the world's best hypnotherapists, then we can hire them. So then we can fulfill a greater capacity than anyone else can. And then we've got the app as kind of the lead into the funnel that anybody can afford. As long as you've got a phone, the app will be free on the front end and then a, a charge for, you know, on the, on the back end. So where I want to go from here is just scale, 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 scale. And, and that's why Bernardo and I work so well together. I, if you read the book called Rocket Fuel, it tells you about the two personality types that are really prevalent in almost every majorly successful business. And it just so happens that Bernardo and I are those two personalities. It worked out that way. So I'm what's called the visionary personality and he's the integrator. I can't integrate to save my life. <laughs> I'm like, we're gonna build all these things. We're gonna do all these things. We have to reach millions and millions of people. And then they're like, great, schedule an email sequence in Infusionsoft and I'm like, oh. what? <laughs> <laughs> I guess none of it's happening. <laughs> so luckily Bernardo's a genius and figured that out. And, and I feel like whenever somebody comes into our orbit, now they know what hypnosis is. They know how to change their life. I've done my duty to them. I care about meeting the people who don't know about it yet. Not evangelizing people who are against it, 
but presenting the truth of this to the people who are seeking solutions and don't yet realize that this solution exists. So I'm like, okay, great. Maybe we've got a million people we've helped through all our videos and everything else. But like, there's 8 billion people. I still have to tell that they can do this if they want to. And Bernardo, the integrator personality is much more about retention and keeping people happy once they're in the community. I'm sort of like, what's not to be happy about? You're here, this is great. <laughs> yes, you have to help more people. <laughs> but that's not how it works, especially not with you know recurring income streams. And so he's really focused on making sure people are thrilled for the long run, which is perfect. You, you kind of need people looking in both directions. So I don't yeah. know if that answers your question, but my my end goal vision is massive. Yeah. Your end goal is, yeah, to help everyone in the world. Why not? Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. that's easy. <laughs> Just we can do that on a Tuesday. Uh, yeah. So my next question for you, thinking back on this journey, thinking back, you know, being an entrepreneur, being a successful female empowered business owner, you know, really helping humans with everything that you've seen and known and the mistakes that you've made, what would you tell your young self who's about to embark on this journey? Like, what would you tell them? What would what mistake would you tell them not to make or what piece of advice or, you know, what would you, what insight would you give from where you're standing? And I know you're just, you still feel you're in the beginning stages of this massive growth and this really long-term road that you're on but you've done so much what would you tell your former self starting out or anyone starting out in, in yeah pioneering in a new space so two things the first one is kind of difficult to say because i i want i i wish the experience had been different but there are people who you just shouldn't work with and you know it right away and if you leave corporate where there's a culture of not a whole lot of self-care and then you come into the wellness space, you just kind of assume everybody's going to be very forthcoming and very trustworthy and very loving and not at all catty or gossipy or dramatic. And they're not going to make things very difficult, but they do, they do. It exists everywhere. And in fact, wellness attracts a lot of people who've been through a lot, obviously. So I would say the minute, the minute you know in your heart or you get a hit in your intuition that you should not work with this person because they are contributing to more stress, more anxiety, more worry, more drama than they are contributing a benefit, you need to either immediately let them go or you need, to, you need to let them go. If you're the boss, if you're not the boss, you need to stop working together. You need to stop that partnership. You need to not sign that piece of paper. And, and I'm not just saying this from my own personal experience. I'm speaking from having worked with some of the world's most successful entrepreneurs of all time. They would give you the same piece of advice because the cost of working with people who are not the right fit it, not just financial, although that can be exorbitant emotionally, especially if you're as sensitive as I am. And uh, my sensitivity is part of why I'm such a great hypnotherapist, but it's a major downfall on the business side of things. I, I understand I, that, yeah. Right? I mean, some of the hurt feelings that I had 10 years ago, if I hadn't done the amount of hypnosis I've done, and even still sometimes, I still feel I'm carrying the weight of those experiences with me into the future. And I have to work so hard to let it go. If I hadn't accumulated that weight so early on, I would have gone further faster. I know it for sure. Right. So mm -hmm. that's, that's a tough pill to swallow. Cause I want to be able to say like, everyone's great. Give everyone a chance, step up your leadership, be a better leader. And it's not to say that they're a bad person, but you know, if it's a bad fit and just have the strength and the self-compassion and the inner knowing to cut ties as fast as you can, <laughs> as professionally as you can and as lovingly as you can, but like, get it out. So that's first thing. From a business strategy standpoint, my biggest mistake, you know, I want to go wide, right? I want to help as many people as possible. And I misinterpreted that desire in our range of offerings. So a few years into our membership site, we had 250 recordings available. 
every single one of those to scale effectively would need a funnel. A funnel is an ad mm -hmm. where people opt in, right, with their email address, followed by email sequences, followed by retargeting. Like, we didn't understand that. So if I had to go back and say to my brand new little entrepreneurial self, I would say pick one thing that you know can help millions of people perfect that funnel, scale it to the moon. You will have so much more money to work with to grow everything else you want later if you do that and then replicate it. So I love helping people with weight loss for hypnosis. We use the term weight loss because millions of people are searching for weight loss, something called search engine optimization. SEO is a key factor for how people find you at you know, a, a lower rate of cost. So people aren't searching for release weight. They're not searching for love my body the way that it is right now. Although those are the things that I teach, right? I'm not really teaching weight loss, but it's sort of a Trojan horse. So we get people in who've been hating themselves and in these diet cycles for years and who are so riddled with shame and self-loathing and, and just unhealthy relationships to food. And then we teach them the truth, which is if you love your body subconsciously the way it is today, that is the fastest way to release emotional baggage that's not yours. It changes someone's entire life. It's not about the weight anymore. It's about loving yourself and empowerment. It sounds fruly and fruitfully on the front end, but when you experience it in hypnosis, you realize it's the truth. So it's been so healing, even though I could care less about rock hard abs, like we're not going the weight loss route. We're just using the term to bring people in. So if we or to find the people rather who are already searching for that. So if we had just done that, just scaled that, we would have been where we are today, potentially seven years ago. But instead I made 250 recordings that sold like 15 of each <laughs> instead of one that could have sold 15 million and then replicate and then replicate and grow from there. So those are, those are the two biggest things I'd say. Yeah. Those are, I mean, uh, I could relate like deep in my soul to your first point where mm -hmm. I left what was ultimately a dream job for me in my career and like being a chief of staff in a tech startup, reporting into a CEO, doing what I loved to the point where it was just detrimental to my health. And I came to that, realize that this wasn't right and to walk away. And that's not an easy thing to do. You know, and, and, you know, and I'm grateful for everything after because I took a step back, reevaluated and got to where I am today. But, you know, that's, you know, that's true. You know, in your soul when, you know, as much as you, that person could be a great human. Yeah. They should not, it, it can be toxic work relationship wise. A hundred percent. And, and in my heart of hearts, I know they are a great human. It is my belief that underneath all the layers of conditioning, everybody is. I may, I know that might sound just like a panacea type, but I genuinely, I've seen it. You know, I've, I know people's hearts when you work with them in hypnotherapy and, and people can be really good humans and a really bad fit. And mm -hmm. that's okay. That is, yeah. they are not your people. Yeah. Before we keep pushing down this entrepreneurial path and talking more about Wagner and, you know, just the connections there, I, I do want to go through this Q&A because I think this is a pretty powerful one and I think it's a good question. So I'll read it out loud if everyone, if, I don't know if everyone can read them, but your story with Alex gave me chills. I am a definite believer in hypnotherapy and I'm so grateful to get to experience it today. A friend of mine actually used it to overcome a debilitating anxiety over a medical condition. I use an app for guided meditation every night and our earlier session reminded me of that. Can you explain what the difference is? Absolutely. And I'm so happy for your friend. That's amazing. Yeah. So people who have a meditation practice when they first experience self-hypnosis, it can feel a lot like guided meditation, which is why I call hypnosis meditation with a goal. Now, if anybody has ever practiced transcendental meditation, otherwise known as TM, which is a fairly popular meditation because a lot of celebrities have spoken about it. It's what Jerry Seinfeld does. Tom Hanks has spoken about it. Who's the handsome Wolverine? Hugh Jack? Yeah, Hugh Jackman. Yeah. <laughs> Jackson, Jackman, handsome Australian Wolverine. <laughs> he does it. So a lot of celebrities do it. And, and there are meditations like TM where for approximately 20 minutes, 
you are repeating a mantra to yourself, or there is Zen meditation where you are essentially not engaging with thought. You, you just sort of view words and thoughts like clouds in the sky drifting beyond you and brings you into presence. So those types of meditation happen in the theta brainwave state. You're in a wonderfully deeply relaxed place and it's going to reset your body, right? You're, you're letting go. You're releasing. Sometimes people say that's a time where you can listen and hear the universe speak to you. You can hear God speak to you. It's in meditation, you're listening, right? Prayer is you're asking or you're, you're the one talking and meditation is when you're listening. But you're not engaging with thoughts per se. You're just kind of allowing a download. So there's that school of meditation. And then guided meditation is interesting. A lot of it's really, really great. A lot of it is misinformed hypnotherapy. <laughs> Meaning, it, you know, if somebody has really great intentions and they want to help you to relax, but they don't know how the subconscious mind works and they don't know how to navigate the subconscious, but they're either going to not effectively bring you into theta because they might not know how to do it. If they're not a trained hypnotherapist, they wouldn't. And therefore the meditation will take place at a higher level of consciousness, either at alpha, which is more like daydreaming or even beta, which is where we are now, normal waking conversation and suggestions told to you in those higher levels of consciousness don't stick quite as much. You have to really be in theta for you to create new neurological links in the brain very, very rapidly. I can go more into the science of that if you want in a moment. And Conversely, so they either might not be effective at getting you into theta if they're not trained to do so, or they might give suggestions that aren't helpful. So the subconscious negates negation. It doesn't pick up on words like not, won't, don't. And so if somebody wanting to be helpful made their own meditation and put it up on some app that sources from the public and they said, you never eat chocolate again, the subconscious hears you eat chocolate again, over and over and over again. Now, that's not to say that it's going to necessarily harm you, but if you're listening to this thing every day and wondering why you're eating the same amount of chocolate or maybe a little more, it could be because the person who made the guided meditation didn't have enough training, honestly, to do it. So as much as I love meditation, and I do, it's such a compliment to hypnosis, right? If, if meditation in that TM style, in that Zen Buddhist style is letting go and listening, there is a real element in hypnosis of intentionally putting in, like we'll weed out the bad stuff, but we will plant seeds intentionally. So they're beautiful conduit. I just would say, be conscious of who you're listening to from a guided meditation, because if they're not also hypnotherapists, they probably don't know enough about the subconscious for you to get the most out of it. And then the third piece is when you're working with a hypnotherapist, who's been trained at my school and in my method, the sessions are interactive. So it's like you're having a conversation, but you're deep in meditation. So your eyes are closed, you're deeply relaxed. And the hypnotherapist will say, we brought you to your safe place. And what do you notice? Oh, it's the beach and I can smell the ocean. And there are these beautiful hibiscus flowers. And then the hypnotherapist goes, that's right. You smell the ocean, there are hibiscus flowers. So you're getting an affirmation of what you're experiencing, which makes it that much more vivid. And it's unique to you. It's customized to you, which recordings can never do. But then if you go, okay, we're going to return to the source of your fear and your phobia of needles. Three, two, one, what's happening? Then the client can tell you what's happening. So then the hypnotherapist can guide you effectively through reframing that experience and helping you release the phobia. So all of the experiences of hypnosis are, are different. Self-hypnosis, you're doing it yourself. Hypnosis recording, you're listening to a generic recording, super powerful, but will be generic. And then with a private hypnotherapy session, one-on-one, -on -one, you're gonna go into your own custom brain <laughs> and get a guided handheld tour through your subconscious and upgrade things based on your unique and specific experience. So I hope that illustrates some of the differences and some of the similarities from, from different types of meditation. It did for me. It definitely did. Um, if we wanted to learn more of like the science behind, like, you know, behind exactly, you said you wanted to push more on the science. I want to, I, I'm a nerd out. I, you know, want to learn more about this and just read and understand what, what science is out there. Where do you push somebody to read and to do that research on their own? 
Yeah. There are amazing new studies coming out all the time about hypnotherapy. The Mayo Clinic, Harvard Medical School, um, Princeton, Yale, Stanford. I mean, every amazing institution that you can think of are, is producing great studies. So for example, Harvard Medical School put one out that showed that hypnosis helped heal broken bones 40% faster interesting than the control group who did no hypnosis so the people in hypnosis imagine their bones healing and they healed 40 percent faster and a study from stanford found that women with metastatic breast cancer who were in the hypnosis group experienced 50 percent was it 50 percent yeah i think 50 percent less pain than the control group but at a 10-year follow-up of the study there was a 50 percent higher uh, survival rate with the group who did hypnosis as well. That's amazing. It's amazing. So uh, there are studies that find that hypnosis is up to 86% effective in healing IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. I mean, the, the range of topics that it can help is amazing. So you can do that research and you can just search, you know, hypnotherapy, um, medical studies, and you'll start to see some very cool things come up. We also have a lot of them listed on our website with links to all the sources. So if I got any of those percentages a little bit wrong, they're all on our site. All the ones I mentioned are, are definitely on the site with, with links to sources. But I can give you the basics as to what's happening. So when we're in a stress state, when we're in a state of anxiety, we're in this fight, flight, freeze, survival mode. When we're in the survival mode, we are the least capable of making changes to our brain. Mm. When we're in survival mode and we need to potentially fight or flee or run and hide or whatever we gotta do, all the, body, all the blood drains from the brain, goes towards the heart in case we need to run. But it also just literally, I mean, it is impenetrable in terms of taking in new information. So if you've ever had a fight with a loved one and you go, I feel like you're just not listening. Like you just can't hear me. It's absolutely true. They are not listening and they can't hear you. If it's a heated argument, they're in survival mode and they're not taking in any new information. When, so most people try to change their lives when they're the most stressed out, when they're the most fed up, when they go like, I can't take this anymore. And it's their least adaptive state. When you enter into the theta brainwave state, so we've got beta where we are right now, if we were to put sensors on our brain and read an EEG machine, we would see that the brain waves we are currently producing look like this. They're spiky, fast, and close together. If we were to look out the window, slow down a little bit, start to daydream, that's alpha. So still pretty quick, but rounded on the top and bottom. Then way down here, we have delta where those waves barely move at all, and that's sleep. So when you're in sleep, your conscious mind is offline. You don't know that you're in bed sleeping. You don't know what's going on. Your eyes are closed. You're asleep. But your subconscious is obviously very alert during REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep stage, when you're dreaming. Then there's this beautiful place that we've talked about a little bit, the theta brainwave state, which is more relaxed than daydreaming, but more alert than sleep. So you are not sleeping in hypnosis. There is no blackout. There is no amnesia, unless somebody suggests it to you in a stage show and you're part of the 50% of people who want to absorb it. There's no natural amnesia. Uh, and you're very much in control. You can open your eyes at any point if you want to. So in theta, you are wonderfully, deeply relaxed and perfectly safe, just as you all felt in the self-hypnosis process. And if you were to do it again, everyone would have been at zero. So Maybe somebody went from a seven to a four, but if they had done another round, they would have gone to a four to a zero. It has a compounding effect. So in this wonderfully deeply relaxed state where you feel perfectly safe and your brain waves are like this, you are able to take in new information for a couple of reasons. But the main one is you now have the surplus energy required to create new neurological links in the brain very quickly. When a dendrite extends from a neuron and another dendrite extends from another neuron and they make a new neurological path in your brain, that's a new belief, that's a new habit. It's very energetically expensive to do that. So if you think about when you learned how to drive, for anybody who knows how to drive, 
when you first learn, you're white knuckling it and you're looking in the rear view mirror and you're looking in the other mirror and your mom's yelling at you to stop swerving and you're like, ah, there's so much going on. It's that energetically expensive to learn how to do something new. And if it's stick shift, forget it. It's all that much more, right? But within a few weeks, within a few months, you've got one hand on the steering wheel, you're singing along to your favorite song, you're chatting with your best friend. That's because this thing you learned has become rote. It has gone into your subconscious. It is now automatic. You have learned it through repetition. But it's very energetically expensive. And so when you want to change your life and you're completely stressed out and you don't have any energy left and it's all being used just to survive, but then you come into theta and you've got all this surplus those connections in the brain actually physically rewire themselves faster. So a study found, it's an old study, it's from the 70s, uh, but still very powerful, the findings, done by a psychologist named Dr. Alfred Barrios. And he found that 600 sessions of psychotherapy, regular talk therapy, resulted in an average of approximately 38% improvement. So 600 sessions for 38% improvement. That same study found behavioral therapy was 22 sessions for 72% improvement. And that same study found six sessions of hypnotherapy resulted in an average of 93% improvement. Wow. So 600 sessions for 38% improvement or six sessions for 93% improvement. And if you take the average between my smoking and my overcoming fear of public speaking, that's about six sessions, right? That's the difference. And I'm not knocking talk therapy. It has its place. It's amazing. I'm not a licensed psychiatrist or psychologist. We don't uh, diagnose. Obviously we can't prescribe medication. There are so many benefits to talk therapy and by far and large, it takes place at the beta level, which is why it takes 10 years. 600 sessions is about 10 years to see 38% improvement because you're talking. And when you talk about your problems and you talk about what your parents did, you're getting mad. So you're yeah. in beta and you're mad and you don't have energy when you're in hypnosis and you're so relaxed and you're imagining being on a beach and you visualize yourself being and acting and feeling the way you desire, you can create those connections in the brain much faster. And that's really why it works. Yeah. I'm, I'm speechless. I mean, we should all be doing this. When you think about the economic 600 sessions versus six, yeah, I mean, that sounds way more financially sound. If you want, it to is. Out. I know. I mean, really, if you think about how much a hypnotherapist should be able to charge based on the transformation they experience, so it's still very economical to work with hypnotherapists, especially at Grace Based Hypnosis. Well, we have a few more minutes left. You've been so generous with your time, and you know, I, you know, just on behalf of the alumni association, the board, and just myself as your friend, like this has been amazing and I'm very, very excited that this happened, but I do want to throw out there, I could talk with Grace all night. I mean, she probably wants to go back with her husband and her family. <laughs> um, but I want to just throw out, if anyone has any more questions, please drop it in the Q and A. I will read them. We will get it out there, but um, Grace, this has been absolutely amazing. And I, you know, I'm so grateful that Wagner brought us together and, you know, really, like what were some of, so we found your love of fundraising. I want to just bring this. I see, I see all of it. Oh, you put your get grace doc. Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah, we could do it later. It's just a new website that's that easier to remember. <laughs> perfect. But I want to take back, I want to end on a Wagner note. Great. To tie it all together. So, you know, what, what was one of the best things that you learned from Wagner? Like that you credit that like are, you are successful today because Wagner did X. Oh yeah. Oh, I credit almost all of my success to Wagner. I mean, I genuinely mean that. And here's why. So I'm glad this is for alumni and not current students. <laughs> because <laughs> I'm not suggesting people do this necessarily. But for example, when I, I, I also founded something called the Earth Floor at Wagner. And it was the first sustainable living floor, I think in a college campus, maybe since the seventies. And I think now it's called the green floor. But through these experiences of creating these organizations, even then as with business now, 
you need funding, you need to raise money, you need to do these things. And I remember, I don't know if it was Habitat or the Earth Corps, but I remember SGA, the Student Government Association, had all these rules and regs about how to get a budget. And I'm not very great at following rules. And I found it frustrating and tedious. Maybe things have changed, even though I understood why they, they had these processes. <laughs> <laughs> but instead, I just booked a meeting with President Richard Garassi and I pitched him. <laughs> okay. And I never had met him one on one. And that was the magic of Wagner is there were so few students compared to say an NYU that you could get to know, you could actually get to know the president of the college. And when I pitched him why I needed this budget, he said, yes, and he took it out of his presidential budget. And so I circumnavigated all this bureaucracy, which is my joy and got to do what I wanted to do. And then from there on out, he believed in me. He lobbied for me. And it's funny that I ended up working in development at Wagner for some time. I was the director of the inner circle there because when I was a student, I almost, I got this close to sending out a physical mailing, asking every single alum in the database of Wagner to give to one of these organizations, probably Habitat. And I remember Sophia Petrus, is she still at Wagner, do you know? I don't know, Nicolina. I don't think so, but that's Nicolina. Oh, she was amazing. Yeah. I don't, I don't think she, I'm not sure if she's there, but I'll have to, I have to look yeah. into that. Yeah. She was an amazing dean. I'm pretty sure it was her. She comes coming after me with a, a golf cart being like, you can't do that. You can't send your own letter to every single person that's ever been to Wagner, you know, <laughs> I was like this close. So I, that all is to say, everybody there believed in me. And when they found out what I was doing, they lobbied for me. And I was close with Provost Devorah Lieberman. And then Myra Garcia, who was the head of development, recruited me and brought me back to work there. And again, I wouldn't have had my first job if it wasn't for President Garassi. And I went through a lot of personal challenges as well when I was working at Wagner and everybody supported me. Not to mention the friendships I had, not to mention the brilliance of the professors. I mean, every school has tenured folks who, you know, maybe it's like, okay, yeah, people grumble about it. But I, I really didn't have that experience at Wagner. I just had one more brilliant professor after another. I mean, still Dr. Kelber, he's why I have a minor in religious studies. I just couldn't stop taking his courses. Literally, I could have had to take them all. I love, I, I contemplated a minor in religious studies. Just because of him, right? He's just that. so good. Yeah. And Dr. Bernardo, uh, who oversaw my thesis in English, she is so tough. And, and as was Dr. Kelber, they didn't let me get away with anything. And I always tried. <laughs> I love that about them, that if I got a good grade, it's because I earned it. And they they pushed me and, but they cared about me. And uh, I mean, there were just so many more. And plus it's just such a gorgeous campus. It's just so dreamy. I, uh, I was very resistant to even driving to Wagner. I really wanted to go to NYU or Columbia. I really wanted to be in the city. And I'd never heard of Wagner when I was a senior in, college, in high school, but my mom insisted and we drove out and I just, I just fell in love walking through that campus. And I'm pretty sure there were cherry tree blossoms, you know, sprinkling the pathways. And I was like, oh, this, this is it. So I love Wagner. I will always support Wagner. I hope that everybody listening is contributing what they can to the annual fund. Nobody asked me to say that, but I did used to work in development. So I care. <laughs> we did <laughs> not ask her for that. No, nobody asked me to do it. But I, I care about this institution and these are expensive places to keep growing and not just going, but growing, getting better. And I feel like the current students deserve the best as do the faculty and all the administration. So I'll always be committed to giving what I can. and. Um, it's just an honor to be here. It's an honor to be able to come back and, and chat with everybody who's been tuning in. And Kaylin, I'm so happy you and I got to be reunited and spend some time together. And it's, no. it's just a beautiful journey. If I can convince you to come to Princeton, New Jersey. <laughs> oh, girl, I'm a Jersey girl. I'm from Kinelon. So I have to go back there every now and again. And Princeton's gorgeous. <laughs> I know. It's, it's, it really is quite lovely. 
Susan Ferret wrote the kindest words in the Q and A, so I don't think I don't need to read them out loud for the whole group to hear. But Grace, you know, it was Susan. Thank you so much for for that. We're so grateful that you were able to, you know, jump in as well. And yes, you know, as an alumni of Wagner College, I am always eternally proud of knowing Grace. So. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. That was so sweet. And thanks to everyone who hung out with us for this whole time and gave hypnosis a chance. I mean, how cool that it's still a little fringe. So I feel very honored and excited that Wagner was was happy to promote a hypnotherapist. <laughs> so thank you, Nicolina. Absolutely. Thank you. I mean, first off, like I am feeling so relaxed after that meditation and so, <laughs> so inspired by your story and your journey, Grace. So thank you for sharing it with us. This was beyond wonderful to put together. I know I learned incredibly valuable lessons from you and I'm sure our audience did as well and found it really insightful and inspiring. And I hope that people look back on this session and think about it and remember it when they are feeling stressed and need to step away and take a moment to meditate. And they think back to this session that um, and that moment that we had shared together. So I hope people are even feeling motivated to start a new project, start, start their own business and, and think about what you have offered and shared with everyone this evening. So thank you to all who have joined. Thank you to Kaylin for moderating this discussion. You led a fantastic chat. And it's for me, it's so lovely and wonderful to see two friends on this platform talking because what makes my job and my career effortless is the love and friendship that I see among our alumni and the love that they have for Wagner and their alma mater. So I am honored to be in this space with you all. And I appreciate you both sharing your story with us and chatting with our alumni. And I hope that we can see each other in person, back on the hill, seeing the cherry mm -hmm. trees and all the yeah. blossoming <laughs> and everything and be together uh, hopefully really soon. So if you're ever in New York, you just you just let us know, and hopefully Absolutely. we're back in the in the fall and we can get together at events too. So looking forward to it. I Ooh. love that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Kaylin. And I can't wait to do this hopefully again soon. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Grace. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Have a great night, everyone. Have a great evening. Bye. Bye.